Well, today I want to talk to you about this thought, how to feel more connected to your church, how to feel more connected to your church. Feeling connected um, is not a given. In fact, we all at times will feel disconnected, not just from church, but from most things in life. The fact is, just because you feel connected now doesn't mean that you're always going to feel connected unless you work at it, unless you do what Scripture teaches us. And here's the deal. When you begin to feel disconnected, you don't have to disconnect. Okay, you need to understand that. Uh, But when you begin to feel disconnected, and I want you to listen to me closely, unless you deal with that, it will lead to discontentment which will lead to your being disconnected. And what happens is we get discouraged and we get dissatisfied because we, get, we start to feel disconnected. And you say, well, how is that true in other parts of life? Well, let me just give you an example. Um, take marriage, for example. It is unlikely that when you first got married... Uh, or when you decided you were going to get married, that you felt disconnected from your spouse. You felt very connected, right? I mean, the fact is, uh, you were very happy. You were very excited. Nobody goes into marriage and and says to the preacher as they're getting married, uh, we're going to, not till death do us part, we're going to wait till death do us part. Uh, Or we're going to give this about five years, and then after that, we're probably done. Nobody does that. Why? Because you don't expect ever to feel disconnected. I mean, the truth is, when you get married, you have, and to use some modern terminology, you feel like you're a soulmate of that person. You feel connected to them uh, all the time. And for good reason. Think about it. When you first get married, on your wedding day, um, You're very romantic. Can we admit that after you're married, some days are more romantic than others, okay? Some days are just tough, right? But when you get married, you look beautiful. People fix your food. They celebrate you. They clean for you. And when you walk into the room, people play music and throw flowers. You got to admit, that's a great way to walk into a room, right? I mean, people just, they're playing music. You know, it's almost like on a movie, you know, and and the only thing that they lack is that gentle breeze blowing people's hair, uh, as you see on the movies. But when you get married, uh, things are great. Then you go on your honeymoon, and there's an exercise in not being in, uh, in contact with reality, right? On your honeymoon, what do you do? Well, you get to sleep a lot, get to eat a lot, everybody else fixes your food for you. You don't have to work, and you have sex a lot, all right? What's not to like about the honeymoon, right? But then, I see somebody going, yes, you know, but then you go home, and then after that, you remember that you've got a job, and you have to work, and nobody's there to clean for you, and nobody's there to fix your food for you, and you have to pay bills, and you get tired. And surprise, surprise, you're not always in the mood, all right? I mean, this is reality. This is life. And then the kids come along, and you have to change diapers, and you have to help with schoolwork. Uh, You have to be the chef, the referee, the chauffeur, the butler, the maid, and especially the ATM, all right? When you get kids, I mean, that's just the way it is. Now, don't get me wrong, Nobody's going to say, uh, especially when you first get into it, marriage is not a good thing. Marriage is not a place where you can feel connected. Nobody believes that when you're first starting out. Uh, Nobody's going to say having kids is a bad thing. Everybody that I know that has kids, they're glad they had kids, okay? Now, there are days you're like, uh, you know, but the truth is we're very thankful. Marriage is a blessing. And kids are a blessing. Listen, 
what happens to you is over time, and listen, unless you deal with what makes you feel disconnected, you're going to get frustrated. It is completely normal for anyone that's been married for a minute or has had kids for a minute, it is completely normal for you to get to a point or to a day or to a time when you ask this question, what am I doing? Why is this going on? Is this what I signed up for? I mean, look, and, and you don't have to raise your hand because I know that every one of us has had these feelings. And why does that happen? It doesn't happen because you stop loving your spouse. It doesn't happen because you stop loving your kids. It happens because of whatever reason you began to feel disconnected from that person disconnected from that situation. And sometimes it's our health. Sometimes it's our schedule. Sometimes it's something that frustrates us. Sometimes it's just life itself that can make you feel this way. And until you deal with that feeling of disconnectedness, you're in danger of losing what is most precious to you. Now I want you to think about this. As a pastor... I've seen this played out literally probably over a thousand times in my ministry, in my life. I've seen people that were completely committed. They loved the Lord. It was obvious. They loved the church. They loved the people at the church. And what happened? Maybe it's their schedule. Maybe it was their health. Maybe it was a disagreement of some kind. Maybe it was an argument. Maybe somebody offended them. And before you knew it, they began to be less and less involved. They felt less and less connected. Now, it's normally like the story of the frog and the kettle. You remember the story? Uh, supposedly, you can put a frog, throw a frog into a pot of boiling water, and it'll jump out. It's not going to stay there. It's too hot. But supposedly, you can put a frog in a pot of of room temperature water and slowly turn up the heat and the frog will boil to death. Now that is kind of what happens to us at times. It's not that it's all of a sudden. It's not that you wake up one day and say, you know what? I'm quitting church. Nobody does that. Uh, It's not that you wake up one day and say, you know what? Today, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm throwing in the towel. But what happens over time is that you become disconnected, or at least you feel that way, which is normal for all of us. All of us will face this, okay? And what happens is that you did not deal with this feeling, and even though you're committed, and even though you're faithful, and even though you're involved, if you're not careful, the things that are most precious to you will fall by the wayside in your life. You say, well... Um, I don't know what to do about that. Well, what I'm going to talk to you about today is how serving can help you stay connected, how it can help you stay plugged in, how it can help you stay uh, pursuing God's purpose and God's plan for your life. Did you know that God has a purpose and a plan for your life? Did you know that he wants you to be a part of his people? You see, Our homes today, in fact, we could just go within a 10-minute drive around here and we would find literally thousands, thousands of Christians who at one time were faithful in church, at one time were involved, at one time they gave, at one time they they were all in. And today, they're in bed. Today, they're not in church. They have allowed the devil to convince them that it's not that important. Oh, it doesn't matter if I go. It doesn't matter if I'm involved, but it does. Most of all, it matters to God and to you, okay? Now, you may not think that it matters if you show up or not, but it does. Not only does it matter to other people, it matters to you. It matters to you. And so today, I want to read to you from a text out of Mark chapter 9, where the disciples were arguing over something silly. 
They were arguing over who was the greatest. And we're going to kind of break that down a little bit today. But Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And when they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them. By the way, they were, it was Peter, James, and John. They had gone with Jesus to, and what happened was the transfiguration. Okay, you remember that? Okay, so that's where they were coming back from. And it says, and some teachers of the religious law were arguing with them. And when the crowd saw Jesus... They were overwhelmed with awe. By the way, that always happens when you get your eyes off the crowd, your eyes off of people, and on to Jesus. And they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about, Jesus asked. And one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. Let me just pause and kind of interject here. This man's boy was troubled by an evil spirit, demon-possessed, okay? Um, In this time frame, in this time that this was written, often uh, people would equate illness with being possessed or harassed by demons, and with good reason, because the fact is sickness is not from God. Sickness is a result of sin, Sickness is a result of our being separated from God. That does not mean that if you get a cold that God's mad at you, okay? It means that this is the natural order of things now because of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, okay? But the reason that they would uh, equate any sickness with demonic oppression is I'm going to show you that this is a part of spiritual warfare, all right, and we're going to look at this in just a minute. So this man, uh, the, the boy was evidently uh, oppressed or even possessed by a demon, and it caused him not to be able to talk. It's like he probably had epilepsy or something of that nature, okay? So he would have seizures. It says it would throw him to the ground. And then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. And he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. Of course he can. The father instantly cried out, and I love this because this is one of the most honest responses that I believe was ever given to Jesus. One of the things that you and I probably can identify with when it comes to our faith, we believe, but we need a little help. That's what he said. Uh, He said, um, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit, that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. And then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. And the boy appeared to be dead. And a murmur ran through the crowd and people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet and he stood up. And afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out the evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind can only be cast out by prayer. In some translations, it reads, by prayer and fasting. And the point is this, that unless we have this intense spiritual focus on prayer, even fasting, 
Uh, fasting is not about asceticism where you're punishing yourself, but rather it is about focusing on God. Until we can do that, then we'll not be able to do the extraordinary in our lives. But through prayer and through faith, we can. Well, in this passage, we see that Jesus was continuing to fulfill his mission on earth. Previously, and we, we're not reading this now, but he said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So Jesus was showing what the will of the Father was. He was on mission for God. He was doing what God had called him to do. He was there to serve. And by the way, this is so incredibly important. And we're talking about serving in this series. And the fact is, you can't truly worship God fully. You can't truly please God completely unless you're doing exactly what Jesus told us to do here which is to serve. He said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. The idea there is not just helping other people because you're a good person, but there's a reason behind it. There's a purpose behind it so that people will come to know Jesus Christ. And I really do believe that if you want to feel more connected to your church, If you want to get to the point where you never, ever quit, you got to serve for the right reasons. You got to do what, you got to remember what Jesus said. He said, I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. When you and I begin to understand why God has called us to serve, when we begin to understand the commandment to serve, the commandment to use our own ability, our own talent, when we begin to understand, completely that our life is not our own. God did not let you be born for your purpose, but for his. Before you were ever born, God knew about you. He planned you. He knew when you were going to be born. He knew how big you would be when you were born. He knew where you would live when you were born. He knew what time you were going to live, what era. He knew what your talents would be because he gave them to you. He knew everything about you. He knew more about you than you know about yourself. He knew what color your hair was going to be, what color your eyes are going to be. He knew how smart you were going to be. He knows everything about you. And until we begin to see what Jesus said here, I didn't come to be served, but to serve And to give my life as a ransom for many until we begin to understand that our very reason for existence is not to fill some skin for a few years. It's not to reproduce. Well, that's part of why God has us here. But that's not your sole purpose, to have a kid or grandkids. Your sole purpose is not just to have a job or a house, or to retire, or a bank account. It's much greater than that. That everything in our life must be about why we live, why we serve. What we do must be about what Jesus said, giving his life as a ransom for many. And I submit to you uh, that Scripture teaches that until you begin to understand that your reason for having your job is not just to get a paycheck, it's not just to work for the company, but it's to bring people to Jesus. It is to live as a light in this world. That's why God has called us. And so I, I believe that in what Jesus said here and what we see in this story, there are some classic barriers to serving. There was the boy that got demon-possessed. There was arguing. There was misunderstanding. So I want to give you really just two points today. I want to talk to you about barriers to serving and ways to, uh, keys to keep staying connected through serving. So let's talk about barriers to serving. Uh, In the previous verses, like I said, we read about the transfiguration. And of course, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus... Uh, They were there, Peter, James, and John, as they were watching Jesus uh, in the transfiguration. They didn't know what to do. They're very impressed by it. It was a spiritual high, okay? 
Remember uh, that, you know, Moses and Elijah, I believe it was, uh, you know, appeared, and it was just a fantastic thing. And then they came down off the mountain, and they got back into everyday life. And they got back to the problems that they were facing. And I want to tell you this. This is a very important thing for you to think about. Often, after a spiritual high, you will experience great temptation. Often, after a spiritual high, you will face great discouragement. Often, even depression. And I don't know why this is, but I do believe that one of the barriers to serving is this, spiritual warfare. This little boy was obviously being oppressed or possessed by a demon, okay? Now, do I believe that every time you get a cold, it's because you're demon possessed? No, I don't believe that, okay? Do I believe there's a devil behind every bush? No, I do not. But I have to be honest, I think that oftentimes we do not stay in touch with the spiritual world enough to recognize that all around us, at all times, there's spiritual warfare going on. Let me just give you two scriptural examples for that. Uh, Do you remember in uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about uh, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible is very clear that much of the time, often, we are facing spiritual warfare and we're not even aware of it. Do you remember, uh, was it Elijah surfing or or Elisha? I think it was Elijah. Uh, And he was so worried, his servant was so worried and he said, Open his eyes, and the, the man was able to see that all around them were the armies of the Lord, and he, God opened his eyes to be able to see all that was around him. I'll be honest, I'm not sure that I want my eyes open to see all that is around me all the time, because there's a lot going on. We'd be surprised, okay? But I want you to understand this, that one of the barriers to serving is spiritual warfare. And I really do believe this. I believe one of the ways the devil will fight against you is through discouragement and even depression. Now, do I believe that there are uh, medicines that will help you with depression? Yes, I do. Do I believe that there are doctors and psychologists and counselors that can help you with depression? Yes, I do. Okay. Do I believe that uh, there are things that we can do to help ourselves get through the depression? Yes, I do. Okay. But make no mistake about it, the devil is a liar and a murderer and a thief. And here's what Jesus said, the devil has only come, listen, only to murder. He wants to kill your joy. He wants to kill your marriage. He wants to kill your passion for God. He does. He wants to steal He wants to steal everything about your connection to church. He wants to steal your opportunities. He wants to steal your attitude. He wants everything about you to be depressed and discouraged and down. He does not want you to get your eyes on Jesus. Because you get your eyes on Jesus, you're going to be lifted. You get your eyes on Jesus, you're going to make it through. You get your eyes on Jesus, you're going to be encouraged. But if he can, through spiritual warfare, cause you to be discouraged, then he's going to do that. I really, really believe that the devil is a liar and a murderer and a thief. And and here's why, and I say this often, you've got to believe what God says about you, not what the devil says about you. What does the devil say about you? There's no hope for you. You went too far. If they knew about your past, they would never even let you walk into this church. What you did last week, what you thought last week, uh, what you felt toward her last week, if everybody knew, he's a liar. And he tells you that you're not good enough. 
And yes, it's true that there is no righteousness in and of ourselves. Our righteousness comes through Jesus Christ, okay? But because of Jesus, He has not only forgiven you and redeemed you, He has called you. and He's empowered you. And, and though they'll tell you, well, you don't have enough money. So? When your father owns everything, you don't have to have that much money, do you? Okay? And so I want you to see this, that uh, when you begin to believe what the devil says about you, you'll never be enough. Uh, there'll never be enough time. Well, that's a lie that often we get in our minds. Well, I just, I would, but I don't have time. Can we all admit that everybody has the exact ama uh, uh, same amount of time every day, 24 hours? Now, what you choose to do with your time may be different than what I choose to do with my time, okay? Now, I, I realize that ultimately, time management comes down to the choices that we make. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that every person has control over every aspect of their job. Somebody's prob unless you're your own business owner, your own boss, somebody's probably going to tell you what to do. Okay, and when to work. And if you own your own business, the customers are going to be the one that tell you what to do and when to work. Otherwise, your business will have to close because you won't make it. So I get that, okay? But what I'm saying is that the devil will often disguise excuses as spiritual warfare because he wants to get you off track. Well, then there are unrealistic expectations. These disciples... They had these unrealistic expectations. They were arguing over who was going to be the greatest, who had the greatest influence, who had the best ministry. And what I've found is that in life, and especially in church, there are often unrealistic expectations. What makes you think that you can come to a place, a church, it's on one of our logos, the perfect place for imperfect people. What is it about that that makes you think you can come to the church and that everybody but you is going to be perfect? Well, that's silly. We often have unrealistic expectations. We expect this of the people that we volunteer with. We expect this from the pastor. Can I be honest with you? Uh, if you're serving God because of me, I'm not saying that I'm not an influence and I don't have leadership and I don't pray and I don't lead. What I'm saying is, if you got your eyes on me all the time, you're going to be disappointed. I can promise you that. Because I may not be quite as good as you think I am. Okay? You say, well, do they let you be a pastor and do that? Well, y'all do. All right, so... But no, seriously, here's the point. I don't want you to miss it. You can have unrealistic expectations. And we get that un unrealistic expectation from the church, from leadership in the church, from the people we volunteer with, or even sometimes, listen, you have an unrealistic expectation about when you serve. You know, a lot of times we think that when we go to church, when we start serving God when we volunteer, that God is going to wake us up every morning to the sound of angels' wings flapping. And we don't know where it comes from, that this beautiful heavenly music just gently wakes us up. Well, that's unrealistic. You probably, like most people, unless you're getting old like I am, and I just wake up at 4 o'clock every morning, I don't have to set an alarm clock, but you probably get jarred awake by an alarm clock. Instead of being gently awakened with the sound of the ocean and angels, you get jarred into alertness. Well, that's, uh, maybe that's not completely true. Until you get your second cup of coffee, you're not alert. But you get jarred awake. We have unrealistic expectations. I think another thing that is a barrier to serving is disagreements and disunity. You can disagree with people. And I, I've got news for you. You're going to disagree. You're not going to agree on everything. You're not going to like everything that I like. But listen, unity is different than uniformity. 
Uniformity is a cult. It, everybody has to look the same, dress the same, like the same thing. God has created diversity in his creation, and I love that. Why do you think that there are 300,000 species of beetles, for goodness sake? We have a God that's creative, okay? But you can be disagreed, uh, you can have disagreements, and it causes disunity. Uh, or another one is unbelief. Unbelief. We just don't believe that it matters. We don't believe that God has called us. We don't believe what Scripture says. And then a lack of prayer. He said that there are big things that only happen when you pray. Do you pray? Well, that's point number one. I don't have very much time left, so let me give you point number two. Keys to staying connected through serving. We're talking about how to be more connected to your church, how to feel closer, how to be a part, all right? What are some things? Well, I think regular personal encounters with Jesus is at the top of the list. You say, what does that mean? Reading the Bible, praying, regular personal encounters with Jesus is very important. However you choose to do it, whether it's reading the Bible. I have the Bible app on my phone. I listened to eight chapters on the way to church today. You say, well, is that the only way to get God's Word? No, but it's a great way, okay? Uh, you can't have an excuse. If you drive, you can't have an excuse not ever to have the Word of God in your mind. Why? Because we can listen to it for free on the phone. So uh, whether you read it, whether you listen to sermons, whether you read it on the computer, whether you like an old-fashioned page-turning actual Bible, okay, it doesn't matter, but have a personal encounter with Jesus. This is what will help you stay in the game when you feel disconnected. I promise you, without it, you will eventually disconnect. You need to have a regular personal encounter with Jesus. Depending on the power of God rather than your own ability. God really began to convict me about that this week. That oftentimes I depend so much on my own plan that I get in the way of what God is doing. Doesn't mean we shouldn't plan. But uh, depend on the power of God rather than your own ability, rather than your own plan. Focusing on Jesus rather than others. The reason they were awed was because they got their eyes off the disciples and on to Jesus. You want to stay in awe. You want to stay thankful. You want to stay in the game. You want to stay connected. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And then not caring who gets the credit. They were arguing over the silliest thing. Who has the greatest ministry? Who has the most power? Uh, who has the most authority? And you know what Jesus stepped in and did, and I love this. He said, what are y'all arguing about? And they wouldn't even answer him. And then he demonstrated that he alone has the power. He's the one that healed the boy, okay? Not the disciples, he did. And what does that mean? Well, you'll get a whole lot done if you don't care who gets the credit. You'll contribute greatly if you're not worried about getting the recognition. And then finally, faith. You want to be able to stay connected through serving? You've got to have faith. Faith in Jesus' ability to heal and deliver. Faith that Jesus has the power over the works of darkness. Faith that grows. Which, by the way, I love what this man did. He said, Lord, I believe. Please help me overcome my unbelief. I can't tell you the number of times I've prayed that prayer. Lord, I believe. Please help me with my, with my unbelief. He'll do it. Have faith that grows and then faith in the power of prayer. And so whenever you begin to feel disconnected, you need to pray. You need to pray more. You need to pray that God will do what only he can do. And when you do, when you do, I believe you'll be able to stay connected. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God and what it means and what it does and how it blesses and how it makes us stay connected. 
And Lord, I pray for every member of our church that we would, through the power of prayer and faith and being connected, that we would do more than we've ever done before, that we would please you with our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Well, I always like to talk about if you need to be saved. And for those of you joining us online today, maybe you need to pray to ask Jesus to be your Savior. Why don't you say something like this? Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe you rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to come into my life and to change me. Take over. I give myself to you. If you'll say that to God, he promises, he promises that he would answer that prayer. And today, if you're in need of praying that prayer, please put it on your next step card. Drop it in the offering. Uh, I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready. I'm going to call them in just a second. Wait just a second. Uh, Here's a couple things you can do. Today, you can give in the offering. You can give either online at uh, stillwaters.online. You can give by texting the number 84321. You can give on the church app. I gave this morning on the church app. Uh, You can do that. It's a very convenient way to give. Uh, Or you can give in the offering, okay? And remember, we're taking this offering also for Serve Your World. We're helping AIDS orphans in South Africa. We're helping people that need medical attention in the Dominican Republic with medicine. So this offering that you give that's designated to hope, all right, you got to designate it to hope so we'll know what it's for, uh, then we're going to be able to help other people across the world, and you'll be able to serve your world. So uh, you can be a part of that. Ushers, would you come? And uh, let's uh, give in our offering. Please drop your next step card. Remember, if you want to be a part of kids ministry, you want to volunteer, put kids Put your name up here and put KIDS, K-I-D-S, at the bottom. And uh, if you didn't get it filled out in time, uh, drop it in the drop box on the way out today, okay? And that'll be a part of what we do this week to help you get connected, all right? So, but anyway, I'm so thankful for all of you being here with us today. Thank you for being a part. Now, uh, in the next week or so, I've got some very important things to talk about. Not that what we talked about today isn't important, but I'll, I'll be text, I'll be uh, sending out emails to let you know uh, we're getting close to being able to close on this property. All right, so getting close. We've got um, we're still waiting in some answers. Uh, we've they've told us verbally we don't have it in writing yet. They've told us that we're approved, and they've told us what we need. I'll be sharing that with you. Um, in uh, the next week or two, and hopefully we'll get closed very soon, all right? So just so you'll be uh, knowing how to pray. Uh, Pray that uh, we get across the finish line, and let's pray this. Will you join me in praying that God pays this thing off? Wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to have a loan? All right, wouldn't that be great? You say, well, is that likely to happen? Well, I don't know. I just know that God is in control. And I know he owns everything. Now, will he pay it off for us over time? That's possible, okay? Are there people that can write a check that would pay for this entire thing? Yes, there are. Um, And the, the good news is we have the money, we have the money to pay this thing off. Did you hear what I said? We have the money to pay this entire thing off. The bad news is it's still in your bank account, all right? So (laughs) anyway, uh, but I'll be letting you know what's uh, going on. (laughs) Some of you are like, you didn't know whether to shout, to clap, and you're waiting. Good thing you waited. Good thing you waited. You know me too well. Let's everyone stand together. I love you. Thank you for being here with us today. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.